Arlene Mayerson, Part 2 of 2, Disability Rights Leadership Series, 1999-2000, a project of Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, DREDF, with Access Video, University of San Francisco. I feel so amazingly privileged to have been part of something that is so historically significant. That when you're in it and you live it, sometimes it's hard to step back and realize that the whole idea of people with disabilities being, having civil rights, having any kind of right to demand anything in society, as opposed to be, being the beneficiaries of whatever was given or whatever kind of charity, is so profoundly different than something for thousands of years. You know, we're talking about reversing something that's so far back into biblical times and such a profound way. And I think that the whole ADA put disability into the national dialogue in a way that is completely commonplace now. And I don't care, you know, my aunt in Dayton and my, you know, you don't have to live in Berkeley or New York or one of the urban centers of the United States to know that there are people with disabilities and that there are issues and that people have things like access needs and uh, it's just there. And I think that even though we had laws before that, it wasn't there. And I think that even though people are debating um, the ADA in ways that I don't like and that are negative and I don't agree with, that it's still an amazing advancement to have it be something that uh, people can have opinions on because there was no opinion, there was no uh, idea of people with disabilities being out and about in the, in the community. And now I think it's very accepted. The first time I actually started to work on the ADA was there was a meeting at the National, we used to have offices at the National Women's Law Center. And there was a meeting at the National Women's Law Center where we had the ADA as it had been introduced in 88. And the idea was, can we make this into a politically viable piece of legislation that could actually pass? What I recall being there was me and Pat, and Kai Feldblum and um, Bobby Silverstein. Um, John Modash. And uh, I don't actually remember Bob Bergdorf, but I think he was there because he mentioned, he has since mentioned, I think, being there. So I think he might have been there, but I don't remember. Um, I think that was about it. It was pretty much of a off-the-record meeting. And the purpose of it was to try to think about what it would take to introduce it as a, in, in, in the new session as a, as a bill that we could maybe get through. The National Council draft had just said basically if you had an impairment, um, you would be covered. and. 504 said, you know, physical or mental impairment that substantially limited one or more major life activity. And people were very concerned because, uh, you know, people who were obese and people who were, you know, things that the Congress would not be sympathetic to could be covered by impairment. And so there was some, there was just a lot of concern that um, not even so much who would be covered that the Congress wouldn't be happy with, but that it look the same, that it look like the same as 504, and um, it would be just broadened in its scope of who it applied to, but that the substance would be the same, and that that would be a very good political argument to make, both um, in terms of equity and also in terms of uh, workability and practicality. So. Um, that was one thing. The other thing was that um, 504 had established an undue hardship standard for what kinds of things that recipients of federal financial assistance needed to do. And um, the 
the National Council draft had made it a much stricter standard. It said that it had to really threaten the uh, fiscal viability of the entity. And people felt that that would be considered a bankruptcy standard and that wouldn't work and that we should stick with undue hardship and that so far undue hardship had been an okay standard, as had the definition pretty much been an okay standard. And that it was worth going forward and people felt politically it was so very important to be able to have 504 to lean on in terms of not doing something brand new. Um, so those were the two main things. The other thing that got discussed at that meeting was, well, now that we're, we were going to try to cover entities that had never been covered before, which is public accommodations, uh, what should the standard be in terms of access? And the National Council bill had said basically, I think it said everything had to be accessible in two years, everything. And everyone at the table, or at least most people, agreed that that was going to be just politically infeasible. Um, and, but so people were trying to, to figure out, well, what do we do? Because everyone agrees that new construction should be accessible, public accommodation, public building, whatever it is, whether it's public, public sounds kind of confusing, but private businesses or public businesses, everything should be accessible in the future. But what do we do about the current? And so at that meeting is actually when we came up with kind of the in-between standard. From the very beginning, the theme was that it was equity with various statutes that were available for race and sex discrimination. That all we were trying to do was bring disability into, you know, the same corpus of civil rights law as everyone else had. So that was very, very big important part of it. It was equity. Um, the idea was that we would extend the protections of 504 to the same extent that minorities and women were covered um, and that the same entities would be covered. Um, and there was also another theme, which was that it was an encouragement of independence as opposed to dependence. I was very involved in the legal part of it, more involved in the legal part of it really than anything else. And so for me, the people that I dealt with every day were Pat Wright, Bobby Silverstein, um, Kai Felbloom. Nan, Aaron's much less. Um, uh, Michael Iskovitz. Um, Carol and Osletic, not every day, um, but at key times. Um, and then when we, we when we got over to the House side, I mainly dealt with Stuart Ishimaro because I was mainly involved in the in the Judiciary Committee. Um, I was less involved in the transportation committees, very less involved. Um, I was also involved with Lizzie Savage. Um, I usually stayed at her house and was involved very much with her. Um, I think the key people were me and Pat and uh, Chai and Bobby and Carolyn and Michael from that point of view that I was involved in. Then there was a whole CCD point of view with you know, Mar Paul Marchand and all the various people that comprised, the, that did all the hard work, uh, you know, walking the halls and getting the information out and writing the pointers. And I actually was involved in writing pointers also. But, um, but my main thing was really focused on the legal part. Basically what happened was we had to work on a draft um, Bobby was kind of a key point in the Senate for getting it out to all the various offices, like Hatch's office, for instance. I think Mark Disler was working for Hatch at the time. And there were comments back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we were, we, me and Hi and whoever else, uh, would try to address those comments, tweak things this way or that way, um, and get it to the point where it was ready for like a major negotiation. At the point it was ready for major negotiation, the, the staffers were involved in that with members of the White House negotiating team, Carolyn Oselenik. We were not in the room, but we were on call. And I remember like I was writing that I was very, I was, you know, drafting stuff for their consideration constantly um, to try to, you know, solve a problem. So. If something would come up in the negotiation, 
we might get word, well, they need to know what this means, so write it out. And so then we can come back and say what it means, and it can be agreed upon the actual meaning. And it's interesting because I have this whole, I mean, this is for, to the extent this is public, um, I think in one way it makes it seem like the Scalia view of legislative history is correct, which is that it's a bunch of staff people doing this um, and that it should be listened to. And I think this process was exactly the opposite. It showed why it should be adhered to, because this was, the Senate bill was a process where, yeah, we were involved in writing things, but it was going not, we weren't writing it and going straight into a report. It was going through many filter systems, and only the stuff that people agreed upon stayed in that report. So the Senate report is really an example of something that was collaborated on and agreed on and negotiated on by all sides. There's nothing like in that report that wasn't agreed upon. So basically the process of the negotiations with the White House and the Senate staff gave rise to the Senate report, which explained the legislation. And then there were certain things which the staff could not resolve and had to go to the principals. And those things were um, the definition of public accommodation and damages. And those were, and then I remember actually, because it was exciting for me because I had never been to Kennedy's private, private office before. And I remember, you know, the one with like real furniture and real pictures and really beautiful and uh, really intense meeting. Um, about going to the White House for the final negotiations. And um, I remember at the time that it was very dicey because Sununu had said he wanted to meet with Kennedy. And there was a strong feeling like Harkin was a very primary author of the bill, um, but Harkin was very gracious about it. Um, but I, I, as I understand it, they, they were both there. Um, but anyway, there was a meeting there to say, well, you know, what are the, what are our parameters? How how much can we give, and what can we do? And um, when the White House negotiations actually took place, um, I think they were within the parameters that had been established before the meeting. The deal that was cut was that our bill, the original NCD bill, then of course our bill also had damages for all the titles um, that people could get damages, and Sununu was able to play the card of, well, you said you wanted equity, so then you should have equity, and there's no damages in Title VII. There weren't at the time. And so, and there's no damages for public accommodation discrimination either. So basically we were, he said, you know, I want to cut back to what the statutes that you're saying you want equity with currently have, which did have a certain logic to it. <laughs> um, and uh, as far as public accommodations, he was saying, he was able to hear that it didn't really make sense to have the exact same definition of public accommodations as in 1964. And so the idea was, okay, our definition at the time we went into the meeting was something like um, anywhere to which customers and patrons are invited. Any, any place that's open to the public, basically. And he said, well, I don't know what that is. That's, that's, that could be, I just don't know what that is. I need to know what the places are. And it was from the, we need to know what the places are, that a bunch of people scurried around and came up with the categories of places. I remember I was very, very strong about getting daycare centers, um, because I remember that was a big issue for us. And something was happening at Dredf at the time. Um, so there were a couple specific things that, daycare centers in particular, and private schools probably. It's amazing to me how much work was done on that bill, how much hard work without tension. I'm very struck by that right now, and um, thinking back on all the work, and there was so much of it, and there was endless amounts of work. I mean, we really haven't gotten into like, well, what was the actual work we were doing? <laughs> and the actual work we were doing, it's like, you know, many levels, but one of the things we were doing was we were constantly answering in writing questions from staff members and their constituents, members, I said, sorry, members, their staff members and the constituents of the members, and we were constantly generating paper. I mean, nonstop generating paper. There are, there are literally, and maybe you've seen them, you know, stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of notebooks that Bobby was, for instance, accumulating to answer everyone's question on every little thing. This is huge. 
Um, and all this work somehow had to get done. It had to be divided up to get done, and it was done. Um, I think I had a really incredibly excellent rapport with Haifa Bloom, who was my co main co-lawyer, who we were able to just do tons and tons and tons of work. Um, I stayed at her house many nights, uh, you know, where we'd finish at four and get up the next day and start going again. Um, the meetings at the, uh, my, my work with Bobby Silverstein was also very collegial. My work with everyone was very collegial and very easy. What I had the privilege of was being able to do the stuff that, be totally involved in the process, be totally in it, be totally, uh, get to draft things, get to negotiate things, get to do all this stuff, but have someone like Pat Wright, who was really taking all the tension. You know, she was fighting all the battles, she was getting all the, you know, if there was someone to be yelled at, it would be her. If she had someone to yell at, it would be her. Um, and so when I think about it, I think it was just this amazing privilege for me to do all this work and be in this process and have this incredible, you know, not only someone who was like this brilliant strategist to just, you know, be with and learn from and all that, but also have someone who absorbed all the tension. I mean, there was really, I was pretty protected from squabbles or fights and some of them I don't even know what they were. Um, so in the main, I feel like I was, it was pretty tension free for me. It was a lot of work, um, especially, you know, the thing is about me coming back to Berkeley is that when I would go back and forth, um, really it sounds like that would be less work, but all it meant is that we could literally keep it going 24 hours a day because we were able to with the facts. The facts was like pretty much a new thing then, um, or at least for us to use it like we did then was a pretty much a new thing. And it meant that when everyone was sleeping there, I was still cranking out stuff. When they got up in the morning, it was on their desk. And so it was a real 24-hour operation. And so um, that, in that sense, that's, that's tension. I mean, you have to produce a lot all the time. But... Um, and even at the very end, the very end of the process, there was a lot of tension about the, ha the Food Handlers Amendment, and there was a lot of tension about the damages issue at the very end. I was involved in it, but I wasn't primary in it. I wasn't, again, it was like I was standing behind Pat, who really had to make the final decisions, and who really had to, like, you know, be looking people in the face like the people that she had been working with in the White House and say, you know, we'll walk from the bill if you don't do this. And so it's different being the person who supports that person and being that person. The only moment that was really like the ultimate was on the House vote on the damages. And the reason why is because at the last minute before the vote, there was a lot of scurrying around by the White House saying, we're going to pool support if you go for having Title VII damages. Because at that point, this is a long story, and I'm sure you've gotten it from other people, but um, the, 1990, the, the 1991 Civil Rights Act had been introduced by Kennedy, which concluded damages for Title VII. Sununu had agreed to have damages for that the ADA would have Title VII damages with a Title VII with no damages. So Sununu felt like he was completely, totally stabbed in the back by Kennedy. And all, all points alert on Republicans to defeat this, because otherwise it would be like Kennedy pulling a fast one on the administration and the Republicans. And the debate from that, from that, um, floor debate is amazing because it's all about who said what. And it's like, Kennedy said this, Sununu said this, Sununu relied on Kennedy's word, so Kennedy screwed Sununu, and every once in a while, you'll, you know, you'll, if you read it, you'll see someone chirp up and say, well, I wasn't there, I don't know who said what, why don't we vote on what's right, like to do, from a public policy point of view. But it had gotten very tied up as a personal thing, and when, when the question came in, about, they, the White House made a proposal basically to us, which was behind the scenes again, but it was 
change the words so that they say what Title VII says now, not what it will say if the 1991 Civil Rights Act passes. Change it to what it says now, which is no damages, and we'll make a secret deal with you that if we are unable to defeat the 1991 Civil Rights Act, we'll then include damages for the ADA as well. And there was a big debate and there was internal dissension with, um, for the first time, really, um, about whether to go for that deal or not. And at that moment, within the disability community. And that was a very, 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 very tense moment because at that moment, uh, people felt there was big dissension. There had never been a dissension, an outward dissension between uh, High and the ACLU and DREDF. And that was the time when they really felt that we should go for the deal, and we really felt we couldn't, that it was uh, a matter of equity and that it would, what it would stand for, what it would symbolize, wouldn't, um, wouldn't fit with everything that was going on, and it could backfire in a bad way. And I think at that time there was a real tension that are we really throwing in the bill by standing by this principle, and because it was a principle. because. You know, you could at least argue, and I think certainly the ACLU would never have agreed to it if they didn't believe we would have gotten the end result the same. But uh, we stood by the principle, and the CCD supported us in standing by that principle. I feel is that Bush had a very, very bad record on civil rights. He was really despised by the civil rights community, and he was at the same time trying to say that he wanted to be a softer and kinder. Uh, and, gentler and softer and kinder or whatever and uh, so I think that disability fit that bill perfectly because it was a way to get civil rights but kind of in a softer kinder kind of way and I think when he was talking about disability civil rights he didn't really have any clear notion of what that meant and it was kind of like a nice thing to say and it had to fit in with the kind of softer kinder thing but gentler, kinder. But it turned out that, you know, when it came down to any hardcore civil rights right, the administration was opposed. So it was, you know, it was supposed to be the, the gentler, kindler kind of civil rights, which disability always has that kind of veneer of, you know, kindness. But when it comes down to, yeah, you want to pay money when you discriminate against someone? No, you know. But uh, just another um, event that happened that we haven't discussed at all is when we went, after all the committees in the House, um, some of which I was not very involved with because they involved transportation, the Judiciary Committee was com I was completely, totally involved with and totally involved in all the negotiations, and that was the end process. And there was also big White House negotiations right before then, um, which were very interesting. So there's a couple of events that we missed in terms of my involvement. Um, the White House negotiations before the Judiciary Committee were, I just thought, it an amazing thing because we were called into the White House because they, at the last minute, wanted some changes. And we, because they had members in the Judiciary Committee who were right wing and who said, you know, they wanted some concessions and they wanted the administration to carry their water on it. And we said, okay, well, before we went to the meeting, we said, well, obviously we should come up with some things that we missed, and we had missed some things too. We went in there with the White House counsel, and they had their three things, and we kind of negotiated, and we, uh, and we had our three things, and we walked out feeling like we had just gotten six things, basically. For instance, they, you know, um, we had had direct threat as a word in the statute, so the Republicans wanted a definition of it because they wanted it to be. Um, you know, more specific and not vague, and you know, they had their kind of right-wing reasons for a definition. Well, it turned out that that was great for us. We wanted a definition, too. We wanted the definition that had come from the R-Line case, which we had based the whole thing on, and that putting in a definition just suited us just fine. And then what we got from it is one of the things that we had realized is that in the way we just defined public accommodations, even though, like you said, we had expanded it quite a bit, we had left out places that, um, were like associations, like the Bar Association. And we had left out a lot of places that would be very important for people with disabilities to have access to, but didn't strictly fall into any of the businesses. And so we were able to get this whole other group kind of patched into the end. And the reason why we were able to get it as well is because what happened was in between, while all this negotiation was going on, Evan Kemp, 
um, who was, of course, very close to the Republicans, went to an American Bar Association meeting to give a speech, and he couldn't get in. And when we heard the story, we looked through the ADA, and we go, well, like, what covers that? And so we were able to, like, change the words of the ADA, change the words of the public accommodation section. At first, it said it only covered public accommodations. And then we, at that, in the White House negotiation, changed it to be anyone who owns, operates, leases or leases to a public accommodation. Well, the difference between just covering public accommodations and anyone who owns, operates, leases or leases to is absolutely tremendous. And we were able to get, we would have never ever been able to go to them. If they hadn't come to us and say we want these changes, which like I say, ended up being kind of trivial changes as far as we were concerned and even maybe better. Um, we would have never been able to go in and go, oh, by the way, we just want to like, expand the public accommodation tenfold. Mm -hmm. But because of this negotiation and the way it kind of went, we were able to get some things which was amazing. But then after it went through all the committees, the ADA went through all the committees in the House and the Rules Committee as well, then it goes to the floor. But before the floor, the floor manager, who was Steny Hoyer, called us all together in an evening meeting, pizza, um, to discuss what amendments that had been given to him, which were numerous, would actually get to the floor. And I thought that was one of the most fascinating meetings of the whole process. Um, and because the kinds of considerations needed to be who they were given by, and not just if they were given by a Democrat, but if they were different relationships as Steny had, and that was very political, inside political, not like disability community political, um, very inside political of how you deal with various members in their various positions and the kind of protocol that's involved. And also the substantive, the substance of the amendment. Like there was a an amendment that was introduced, it was by someone, I'm blanking on his name also, but who Steny was very inclined to give his amendment some kind of hearing. But it was also an amendment that I felt very scared of substantively. And it, what it was was um, the amendment was that if you that if an employer spent 10% of someone's salary, that that would be considered a hard, undue hardship. And I thought that was very appealing and that that could pass. And I really didn't want it to go in. But Steny felt, first of all, who it was coming from was important from his consideration, but also that it was so substantive and so legitimately substantive that it needed to go. Um, so that was a very interesting process before the House vote, so that there were a couple of a lot of amendments that never even got to the floor but some that were very scary that did get to the floor. It was voted down, it was very interesting, because it was bi bipartisan voted down, because people were afraid the Democrats, basically the rap of the Democrats were, well, that's fine if you're Donald Trump, but it's really bad if you're Donald Trump's secretary. Mm -hmm. That was that, mm -hmm. the Democrats' point of view. And the Republican point of view was, if you set a 10% cap, you're setting a 10% floor. And everyone's going to go, well, hey, you haven't spent 10% of my salary on me yet. And now I want my, you know, blankety, blankety, blank. And they thought that it was like, that was a very interesting thing because from the Republicans' point of view, 10% was a lot. And they didn't want undue hardship to necessarily be read as meaning that much. So it did go down, but it was scary. The business community really organized, but they didn't get very far. And I think that the members didn't really want to come out against people with disabilities, that there was still, it just would read wrong. It was just hard to figure out how to come out against people with disabilities and still look like a good guy in our culture. And so I think it's like a very interesting commentary on how the thing that we were fighting most against was just a charity view ended up kind of coming into our favor in terms of the voting. My personal contribution to the ADA is in its, in its words. Um, I think that I had a lot to do with drafting. I had a lot to do with legislative history. Um, I had a lot to do with knowing things that needed to be in there um, from my experience working as a lawyer because even though like we started out this conversation with me starting in the 80s and being really green, by the 90s I, was, I actually had more disability law experience under my belt than most people um, in the country. Um, so I was able to take the legal concepts and also put in a disability spin. The image that I'm having is when we were waiting for the vote in the House, and it was 
just the whole the whole anteroom was filled with people with disabilities and people from all over the country and people who had worked really hard on the ADA and it was a you know a monumental time. Disability Rights Leadership Series, 1999-2000. Producer, Phyllis Ward, Access Video. Interviewers, Phyllis Ward and Mary Lou Breslin. Post-production, editing, captions, audio description, Dave Newell. Stewardship, promotion, distribution. Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Mary Lou Breslin, Susan Henderson. Special thanks goes to both the sung and the unsung heroes who worked tirelessly to make the Americans with Disabilities Act a reality. The Disability Rights Leadership Series owes a debt of gratitude to the individuals who agreed to be interviewed and without whose passion and dedication the ADA would not have become law. The series would not have come about without the vision of Pat Wright, the longtime Director of Governmental Affairs for DREDF, and Arlene Mayerson, DREDF's Directing Attorney, who conceptualized the series and the interview themes. Thanks goes to the University of San Francisco for sponsoring the project that included the Disability Rights Leadership Series and the Bancroft Library, University of California, Berkeley, for accepting an archival copy of the unedited interviews and providing a safe and permanent home for the collection. The series would not have been possible without funding from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. A list of the interviewees and links to their interviews can be found at dreadf.org. 2015.